Hi there, thanks for coming here tonight. Um, I would like to introduce Natalie Strecker, who has recently returned from Palestine, Israel, where she served as a human rights monitor or ecumenical accompanier with EAPPI. Natalie is the first Channel Islander to be selected to serve with EAPPI, which is run by the World Council of Churches. EAPPI work in the occupied Palestinian territories to document and expose human rights uh, violations that are being imposed under the Israeli occupation in the West Bank. First, I'm going to speak about a few of my own experiences when I travelled through the West Bank for a week in October with my good friend Harry. I've been reading and trying to learn and understand a lot about the situation from afar for quite a few years now, so it felt it was time to finally see what things were like with my own eyes. Knowing that was in Hebron tip the scales and I booked the trip. I guess I wanted to explore and challenge the things I thought I knew or believed. From home, I sometimes questioned whether I was reading things from more from one side, whether or not things were exaggerated, was I unfairly biased in some way, what was life in occupied West Bank really like? Sadly, one opinion I will share is that things were as bad or even worse than I believed for the Palestinians I met. And it only seemed to be getting worse and more desperate week by week, month by month, year by year. Things always seem to be changing for the worse when you spoke to people. It feels almost impossible to explain in any meaningful or useful way, so I'm just going to share some of the many things I saw during my short time there. I met a father of several children who explained how he is terrified when taking his children to school each day because of the actions of settlers or soldiers. He told me how he ended up mesh wiring over his own roof and windows to prevent the constant stream of false allegations against his family of throwing stones which could result in the arrest and prosecution in a military court of himself or any uh, of his family members. He knew too well that no evidence was needed for him to be arrested and would take place in a court system that sees a conviction rate of over 99% for Palestinians. I heard an ex-Israeli soldier explain to a delegation the systematic terror he was trained to inflict on families in order to pressure families to flee and to enable Israeli settlements to grow. I played music and sang a song with a local musician named Al Major, who informed me how members of his family had been forcibly moved to Gaza and how he was denied travel permits in order to visit them. Al Major's cousin was shot dead just last year by the Israeli security forces and he shared with me how he hoped to see his brother and family again someday. I met a mayor in Beit Amar, Hebron, who felt helpless following being informed by the Israeli military that they were going to be building a new Jewish-only road in a few weeks' time between illegal settlements, so Israelis would no longer need to drive close to a Palestinian refugee camp, resulting in thousands of dunams of agricultural land being lost by families. <coughs> families whose livelihoods depended on the ability to farm the land destroyed in an instant, with no real ability to challenge this as the legal system and process is stacked against them due to the courts and administration being run by their occupier. I heard a market trader explain how the mesh nets over the Palestinian marketplaces were there to catch objects thrown by the settlers above, who had illegally taken over the homes above the market. These objects, which you can still see in the nets, included stones, bikes, rubbish, and also bottles of urine. In the past, these objects had injured Palestinians, although health issues can arise from the actions of settlers, as at times they target Palestinians with dirty water and feces. I met a head teacher of a local school who was dismayed as he pointed to the piles of rubbish dumped and burned in front of schools on a regular basis by settlers. I saw barricaded entrances and doors welded shut to Palestinian homes and shops, evidence of residents and vendors forced out of their neighbourhoods of generations. Several of these shops and residences had been graffitied by settlers with the Star of David. As I travelled around the area, I witnessed cars with Israeli number plates cruising through road checks on roads that could be used by both Palestinian and Israelis whilst every car with a Palestinian plate was queuing to be stopped, searched, questioned. I observed children and teachers going through checkpoints to get to school every day and faced the humiliations of taking their trouser belts off, made to lift up their tops, dresses, trousers and being constantly interrogated by soldiers. I saw a ruined Palestinian dust track streamed with rocks and litter, separated by a large wire fence with a perfectly tarmacked Israeli settler road next to it. The planned and calculated grinding down of society here was unquestionable. The systematic ethnic cleansing was evident wherever you looked. The struggle Palestinians face and the oppression and illegal occupation they live under is difficult to fully comprehend without witnessing it. It is easy, of course, to ignore what's happening when you land in the party city of Tel Aviv. But once you cross into the West Bank, it's inescapable. It screams out to you along the road when you observe the military watchtowers, the ruins, the demolished homes, the checkpoints, the roadblocks. I was only in Hebron a few days, and what I saw there shocked and moved me more than ever, any other place I visited. When you go to Hebron, is it impossible to ignore what is happening? 
It is in your face. It is impossible to call it anything but apartheid. I've mentioned lots of negative things here. However, I want to share something else with you. The one thing I didn't expect was the positivity and optimism from the Palestinian people. I received nothing but kindness and love from every stranger I met and their ability to endure and persevere through the most seemingly hopeless and unfair of struggles was inspiring. Wherever I went, I met people with the most tragic stories whose courage and optimism was phenomenal. I've never met such generosity and felt like I've made such close friends in such a short time. This made it even more heartbreaking to learn that many friends I have made at the Youth Against Settlement Centre, which is a grassroots centre of volunteers, mainly young people, who non-violently resist the occupation and colonisation of their beloved Hebron, were attacked and hospitalised on Christmas Eve as they were beaten by settlers, protected by soldiers, with breathe blocks and had to witness their centre trashed. I take my hat off to Natalie as in just a few days I felt like part of a family, so I can only guess how she felt after living and witnessing the situation there for three months and standing up for the oppressed. I hope it may encourage and inspire you all to learn more, to speak up, to act and become part of the growing international community of ordinary people who condemn this occupation and the human rights atrocities inflicted upon the Palestinian population. They need our support now more than ever. Please can you give a warm welcome to Natalie. Good evening, so for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Natalie Strecker and I recently returned from having served three months as a human rights monitor in the city of Hebron in the occupied Palestinian territories. I'm just going to show you a map here for those of you who don't know the region because I found out from lots of young people that I've met that people aren't aware of Palestine. So here we have um, obviously a world map and you can see it really is just a tiny area. Um, here you see it. The orange or peach kind of area is what is um, recognised now internationally as Israel proper. And oh, Crumbs, we're having problems with our technology today, so I'm hoping it won't fail too often. The green areas are what is recognised as the occupied Palestinian territories. And I was based here, down here in the southwest, in the city of Hebron. Now, I want you all to do something for me. I want you to reflect back on your school years. For some of you, that will be a lot longer than others. But I want you to think back to that time and think about a teacher that stood out for you. Now, it may be a teacher that was your favourite, but a teacher that, for one reason or another, made an impression on you. And I want you to think about that teacher and to picture them. I also want you to do something else for me. I want you to think back to a day at school that stands out for you. Think about what is it about that day that makes you remember it particularly? Was it a good day? Was it not such a good day? But what was the reason for it standing out for you? Now, it really took me quite a while to put together this presentation because we're encouraged by EAPPI, who I went with, who I'll explain a little bit about um, further down in the presentation, to focus on one or two stories of my time there. And you can imagine after three months in Hebron, it was really difficult with all those stories whizzing around my mind all of equal importance to think about just a couple that stood out for me. But as I work in education, and it's an area that I'm very passionate about, I've decided to focus on this particular subject. But obviously this means that there's many other stories that I won't be able to share with you this evening. So, were you able to picture a teacher? Can you remember why? Can you remember their name? <coughs> My um, teacher that stands out for me is Mrs Bunting when I was at Holyoke. Anyone who went to Holyoke might well remember her. But she was a wonderful teacher who always encouraged me to stand up for what I believed in. But she also did something else. She taught me to question um, things, whatever it was that I learned, to really inform myself. And I think that's such a terribly important thing that we miss um, today. And I think it's led us into some really dark areas, both historically but um, equally more recently when we look at the world situation. So when I was in Hebron, there was a teacher there that stood out to me for an altogether different reason. It was a teacher who stood out to me because she told me she was scared. I can't tell you her name, I, even though I saw her every single day when I was undertaking the work that I did, but I can see her face. And I'm going to show you a photo. So you see here, this is some teachers standing at the checkpoint. The lady there with the um, pink um, headscarf, her name is Nora. 
She was the um, headmistress for the school that we mainly focused on, which is a school called Cordoba School, which was on Shihada Street. And you can see another teacher standing behind her. And just between the bars is the teacher that I'm referring to. Now, it's not this situation that led her to tell me she was scared. This is a normal, everyday scenario that they find themselves in, where they're waiting at the checkpoints for the um, Israeli um, military to open the checkpoints so they can go through and head to the school where they'll be teaching that day. I'm going to come back to that story, but first of all, I'm going to show you a map of where it was I was positioned. So here we have the city of Hebron. So Hebron itself is, is a territory, is a, is a huge area of land. There's lots of agricultural land. But I was actually assigned to work in Hebron city. And you can see that it's split there into two areas, H1 and H2. Now H1, which is a darker grey area, is considered to be under Palestinian authority. But I will refer to what that means a little bit later. But I was based in H2, which is the old city. So H, um, H2 is exclusively under Israeli military control. And I used to come through every day through this checkpoint here, which is checkpoint 56. Um, the kind of brown areas that you see are Israeli settlements within the Palestinian neighbourhood. And you can see there it lists on this map um, a number of obstacles, which are 111 there, and it refers to the different type of obstacles that, that those are. And these are all obstacles that severely restrict Palestinian movement in the area. And this started occurring after, obviously, the area has been um, occupied since 1967, but these obstacles started being put in place in 1994, after the um, Ilibrihimi Mosque massacre, which saw a settler from Brooklyn, USA, massacre um, Palestinians as they were worshipping in the Ilibrihimi Mosque. As a result of that and the protests that followed, they started putting a number of these obstacles in place. I'm just going to give you some key facts there. I'm not going to go through all of them um, because of time. But as it says there, Israel exercises control over 20% of the city of Hebron, which is known as H2, and this accommodates about 40,000 Palestinians alongside roughly around 800 settlers that live in, in five compounds. Um, in addition to that, you have a settlement that's called Kiryat Arva, which is a settlement that accommodates around 7,000 um, settlers. So obviously because of the ongoing occupation, it's been a site of friction that's resulted in Palestinians perhaps at times resorting to more violent resistance and it saw a number of attacks from 2015 um, for a period of time um, against mainly the Israeli military but resulted in 27 Palestinian fatalities. Um, the majority of those were suspected perpetrators. Um, but in addition to that, um, and this report, I think it was about from 2016, I took from um, the uh, UN office, OCHA. 69% of residents in H2 have reported that they have suffered from settler violence in the last three years. Um, also, the area of Tel Ramedo, which was kind of on the, if you remember the map, was on the top left-hand side. And that is an area um, of a Palestinian neighbourhood with a couple of settlements within it which has become a closed military zone. And what that means is all the Palestinians in that neighbourhood are numbered and they get put on a register. And that register is what enables them to go through the checkpoint. But you have to be living there. So if you come to a checkpoint and your name isn't on that list, you are not entering into the old city. And you can imagine what impact that has on people if their family members have married, perhaps in H1 or moved into other areas, or perhaps um, for work and such. It's made it very difficult for people to visit their families. 40% um, of the housing stock um, of the old city has been abandoned by the Palestinian residents because of the impact that the restricted movement and the occupation has had on their family life and on their livelihoods. In addition, as a result of the same thing, 512 Palestinian businesses in the area have been shut down um, by military order, but a further thousand have been closed as a result of um, issues restricting customer and um, uh, supplier access to the area. 
So just returning to that story about why the teacher was scared, as I said, it has nothing to do with this daily having to stand at a checkpoint. And obviously I'm sure there's many times when, when she has been scared, but a time that caused her to vocalise that fear that she had. And the first um, account I'm going to refer to, because there were two, two accounts where this happened with this particular teacher, and it was when we were giving protective presents for Cordoba School. Now there's a number of schools, there's 10 schools in fact in the old city in, in the H2 area. But unfortunately due to the lack of international presence, we're actually only able to monitor. We um, three between the different organisations, um, three that we kind of supported with. Um, but the one that was our priority was at a school called Cordoba School. And the reason why we were asked to provide protective presence is because for many years the children and teachers attending school were facing settler harassment and violence um, and that was why because what they've what um, time has shown and through surveys is that they found that harass, harassment and violence tended to reduce when there was an international presence in the area so the particular morning the first account I'm going to refer to you was when we went at 7.30 as normal through that checkpoint 56, waiting for the children to come down the hill and for the teachers to come through their checkpoint. And um, there was this huge group of soldiers, between about 20 and 30 Israeli soldiers that had actually turned up in their, in their running gear, some with guns over their shoulders. And they, um, they seemed to show no awareness for the situation of children. Children would start walking down the hill and seeing the soldiers, they, they would just stop and look and clearly be terrified about what was happening. But what happened on this particular day was the teacher walking through the checkpoint, I saw her, she just stopped and became what seemed to be paralyzed with fear. And I walked across to her and I asked her if she was okay. And she said to me, I'm scared. And I can understand that. So I took, um, put her arm inside my arm and I walked her past the soldiers so that she can continue her route to school. The second occasion was when I was, um, when she was finishing school, because we used to do both the morning and the after school run, which was around lunchtime. And the reason why Palestinians feel, finish school at lunchtime is because settlers finish school a bit later, and it's to try and reduce their contact with one another. And so I went, here you can see um, these are the stairs, the right that they go to school, and also the stairs that they come down. It's got a checkpoint at the bottom. And during my time there, they installed that yellow gate with a little metal thing that comes across just to make access even harder. And they're only narrow stairs. And what I would say with the stairs is that they're beginning to crumble, but the Israeli military won't allow them to do any refurbishment or maintenance of either their homes or their, their um, buildings or, or anything else. And on this day, there were settlers coming up. So basically, behind the soldiers there is what's called a sterile zone. And although it's a Palestinian neighbourhood, the Palestinians aren't able to, able to go beyond that because there's settlers living in that area. And that's what happens when a settlement's set up. There's an area around it that Palestinians are not allowed to be um, going a certain distance of. So the, but there were some settlers going on a tour up here with a number of soldiers. And again, I saw this, this teacher just stop and she just looked at me and she gestured her hands towards me. And I walked up to her again and she says, I'm really scared. So I took her hand and I walked her past the settlers so that she was able to continue her journey. Now, if you reflect back on that teacher, the teacher that stood out for you at school, can you imagine them ever standing out for you for the reason of being scared? of walking past settlers and soldiers. I hope that that's not a situation that any of our teachers will ever have to face. But the sad truth of this is that it's not just teachers, adults facing this. This is children, students, preschoolers going to kindergarten that are facing this. And this is not the only situation that they face. And I'm gonna take you through some photos and just give you a little bit of context so hopefully it will explain a little bit more. So here we have Shuhada Street, and this is, so we were standing at the bottom of the hill, and this was just to the left, and the street that they would walk on to Cordoba School. So these are just some of the students that we meet every morning. What I would say, although it can seem quite grim at times, these, these um, students generally would come running down, so happy to see you, and be high-fiving you as they walk past um, 
sometimes I was terrified that they were going to fall and hurt themselves because of rain and steam. But children seem to be able to do incredible things that perhaps we're a little bit scared of doing as adults. Here we have the students as they leave um, the uh, school, those stairs that I referred to before. And actually what you can't see, I don't know, you might have just seen in the background that little kind of sort of turquoise gate thing. Now that's a gate um, that Israel has installed, um, the military, and actually it's closed all the time and those students can't go through until the um, Israeli um, army decide to open it. They've got like a real rudimentary kind of police system that opens the door and allows the students to go through. This is one of the other schools we covered. So I told you we covered about three, our main focus, Kordobad. But this is a Ketun checkpoint. And near here, you have two schools, one called El Ibrahimi School, which is an all-male school. And you had another one called El Fer, which I don't know how to pronounce, um, but it was an all-girls school. And the students would have to either come through if they were going to one of those schools or go through to the other side in order to attend a school in the other district. And this was, like I said, another area that we gave protective presence for. Now this photo here is a photo I took during the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. And so what happens during the Jewish holidays is a number, although there's about 800, as I said, in, in the particular, in the old city particularly, obviously you've got Kiyat Arba with a 7,000, but in the old city what happens is you get a number of other Israelis, hundreds, and for other holidays, thousands, that um, descend upon Hebron. Um, and during that time, Palestinian freedom of movement gets restricted even more. On this occasion, there was actually already a number of soldiers um, around and about, but on this occasion, the children and the teachers were just stopped and made to wait for an extended period of time. And I actually went up after about 10, 15 minutes. I went and asked an officer why um, the children and teachers weren't being allowed through. And the officer was, was pleasant enough, and he said that he recognised that, and he would go and speak to the um, border police who actually monitor this particular checkpoint. And he came back to me, he said, well, what it is, he said, we will be letting the children through, but we have to wait for the other soldiers to arrive to get into their positions. And the reason for that is in order to protect our civilians. So they wanted the children to wait, so the Israeli settlers that come into the area, which are predominantly adults, would be protected from these children just trying to access school. Here is another um, photograph that I took um, at El Salaime um, checkpoint, and the situation here is a young boy of about six or seven had thrown a stone over the fence. Um, it hadn't hit anybody, it made a bit of a noise on the floor. And the soldier came out, well, the checkpoint was closed and the students began to congregate out, out of the, outside the checkpoint, not being able to go through the turnstile. So I went and asked the soldier and challenged him on why he wasn't allowing t um, the students through. And his response to me was, they know the rules. They are not allowed to throw stones, regardless of the fact that it was just a young boy that had thrown the stone that everyone was going to be held to account for that action. If you think about if any of you have children, how easy it is to control your children at times, especially maybe when they find themselves being frustrated. There was some good news though on this day because I was able to um, speak to um, a guy that I developed a good relationship with in the UN office, the Ocha office, and he was able to speak to the various powers that be and eventually were able to get the checkpoint opened on that day. But immediately after the students went through, what they did was in the top left, you see like another turnstile, they actually closed that to stop adults coming through to go about their daily business. Now, you might be asking yourself what that smoke is. That's tear gas. And for weeks on end when I was there, almost on a daily basis, we witnessed or heard, if we weren't in, immediately in the district, sand grenades being thrown as students were leaving school. And also tear gas, for no discernible reason, we went and found out what was happening, but for no discernible reason, this was something else the students were having to face. Here we have a photograph of a soldier um, just about to fire a gas canister. I don't know if you can see the children on the left-hand side. How old are they? 
And these photographs, actually, these last two photographs, the rest are mine, were actually kindly lent to me by Christian peacemaker teams who do very similar work to what we do, um, the EPPI do in Hebron. This wonderful man is called Hassan. He's the principal of Ili Brahimi um, uh, Boys School. And he was a wonderful man because every time he went to monitor Ketting checkpoints, um, Tom will, and Harry will remember this, he'd always invite us to go for tea and coffee and talk to us about his students. He was so passionate about education. And what he explained to us was during the Sukkot, and actually we had this um, confirmed because we, we um, frequently got reports, is that during the Jewish holidays, they would actually close a number of the checkpoints, which meant that children can actually attend school on those days. And during the period of uh, Sukkot, school attendance just for his school had dropped to 70%. What he also explained to us is that his school only went up to the age of 15. And the reason for that was because at 16, uh, the Ismi um, Israeli military require the children to register and have um, identity cards. And because of concerns around their safety, once you got an identity card, many parents, if they were able to continue with the education, would move their children into the H1 area in order to attend schools. Um, this is another photo here that's related to education. And I don't know if you can see the guy there with the glasses standing. That's a good friend of mine called Isa Amro. And if you're interested, he's an amazing, inspiring man. Um, he's the only EU and UN formally recognised human rights defender and is also the subject of an Amnesty International campaign. Um, actually, he's going to be coming into the island in April if you're interested to deliver a talk. Um, but anyway, this is him standing with his son um, that he'd just gone to collect from school. His son attends a school in the H1 um, district. And basically, this is during the Jewish holiday. So do you remember I said to you that H1 is supposed to be under Palestinian Authority control. Well, this is really an indication that that isn't really the case, because what happened was during, this is again during Sukkot, they closed the area. So, and the reason for that is because settlers do a number of tours through the old city. So in order to keep these people apparently safe, they closed down areas of H1. And um, we're going pink there, so hopefully Lee will be able to come and sort that out. Um, but basically, um, what happened during that time is residents aren't able to access their school, um, access the school or their homes. And so, on this occasion, Issa was um, required to take a huge detour that took him um, all the way around, took him quite a while to go through another checkpoint um, a number of miles um, away. And also, um, it meant that people, again, couldn't access school. What we also counted, and it was one of the activities we did on this particular day, was count the number of shops that were closed under military order. And imagine this is their livelihood. And we counted 151 shops that were closed in H1. So you can imagine um, the impact that that has on children. This is um, something from uh, um, UNICEF that was kindly lent to me by <laughs> my friends who works at OSHA. Um, I'm not going to cover all of them because obviously it covers a variety of areas um, of the impact of occupation, but just the ones in relation to school. So it highlights their secondary school net attendance. So it gives you both the, um, this is from 2014, the percentages on both for the West Bank and for Hebron specifically. And I'm obviously focusing on Hebron um, although the, the, the issues obviously relevant for the whole of the region, but obviously because that's where I was based. But you can see there um, in Hebron, attendance is 53% for secondary school for males and 64% for females. Um, in the wider West Bank, um, that's 63% and 80% respectively. Um, Palestinians, uh, children detained for security-related offences. I can't talk about um, child detention today, but I'd really encourage you to have a look at that because it really is a big issue. So in Hebron, in 20, um, that was just for May 2018, they had 29 um, that were detained, and in the whole of the West Bank, you had 290. Incidents of killing children, just between the period 2016 to 2017, 17 in Hebron, 51 in the wider area. Incidents of um, injuring of children for the same reasons, because of occupation, sometimes also settler violence, 
105th up again for the same period, 2016 to 2017. You have 154 for Hebron and 2060 for the wider West Bank. An incidence of education interference, and that would include things like when the, you have military incursions into schools over there, which does happen from time to time when a military will go in and arrest a child, generally on for suspected stone throwing. Um, 77 for Hebron, again for that same um, period, 2016 2017, and 342 for the wider West Bank. So when we think about this, what does the international law say in terms of the obligation um, an occupier has towards education? When this photo here, there you can see the guy there is, is my, my teammate Rami, who actually just visited the islands a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this was us monitoring Ketun checkpoint, a couple of children that are going to be going through to attend a school on the other side. But this is the important point. Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Israel ratified, says states, states parties recognise the right of the child to education. Another one here from Article 50 of the Fourth Geneva Convention states, the occupying power shall, with the co cooperation of the national and local authorities, facilitate the proper working of all institutions devoted to the care and education of children. And Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups. And when I consider that law, I have to ask myself how the occupation continuing in the manner it, do, it does, how and what is it promoting to the Palestinian people, to those children growing up in this environment? <coughs> so obviously I've said that I've just chosen to focus on the subject of education, but there are so many issues there that I can't speak about today. And those are just some of the other ones. Some of them are things that we've already discussed, but these are some of the other human rights issues, um, which include obviously settlement. And I'll speak a little bit more about what settlements mean. So for those of you who don't know what settlers are, um, because I think a lot of people, perhaps if you're not familiar with the, with the region or, or the situation there, you might not necessarily know what that is. But basically, settlers are Israeli citizens that may have been born and brought up in Israel or may have come from any other place in the world um, that move into the occupied Palestinian territories. And if you're thinking, well, what is the issue with that? I'd probably refer back to our own occupation as an island and consider what a similar thing might be. It would be Germany deciding to move its population into Jersey and taking over parts of Jersey and then restricting our movements. So you can imagine what issues could possibly arise from that situation. So here's just some figures, um, and this I believe was from 20, 2018, I think this is up to date. So there's about 650,000 settlers um, in the occupied territories. Um, since 2000, um, there's been an increase of 450,000. And this is really important, 43% of the West Bank is allocated to settlements, um, both local and regional councils. Approximately, in order to maintain the security of the settlers, 540 internal checkpoints, roadblocks and other um, physical obstacles impede Palestinian movement within the West Bank. Um, and as I said, that's primarily to um, protect the settlers. And that, on all my, um, where I've got information, you'll see there's a source at the bottom of that. So again, what does the law say about settlers? Well, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention states that the occupying power shall not deport, um, uh, yeah, deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory that it occupies. I just wanted to include these photos because actually this is a road that Tom referred to, but I think 
it's a really powerful um, photo or two photographs there because I think it really shows two people living under two different situations and on this black and white one here on the left you have what is a Jewish only road so this is the road tarmat wide that the um, Israelis um, settlers are able to use behind the fence there you can see that Palestinian man that's the Palestinian dirt track that they use that's been fenced off and at times actually a bit further down there's a, a door that actually can get locked at any point in time that won't even allow them to come through um, and actually the photograph there on the left is what that dirt track looks like so lots of rubbish you can imagine this is a road that's having to be navigated by children um, by the infirm by elderly people so when we consider occupation as a general thing, because sometimes occupations do occur. What does a law say with regard to that, with regard to how people are to be treated, the civilian population? When Article 27 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it says protected persons are entitled in all circumstances to respect for their persons, their honour, their family rights, their religious convictions and practices, and their manner and customs. They shall at all times be humanely treated and shall be protected, especially against all acts of violence or threats thereof and against insults and public curiosity. So these are just some of the situations I said I witnessed regarding what Palestinians, particularly teachers, children, students, are having to face every day. I want you to think about an average Jersey family. What's it like for them to attend school. Generally they get up, don't they? Maybe eat some breakfast, go to school, travel to school. Maybe the student might be worried about not having completed homework on time. Maybe they're worried about a mark that they got in a piece of coursework, or maybe whether they got the grade that they needed um, in an exam that they had sat. But in Hebron, what is it echoed through most of those areas? Well, in in the West Bank in general, about education. These aren't the worries they have. It's not so simple for them. Their reality, the things they need to worry about when they get up, is checkpoints, settler harassment and violence, child detention, tear gas when they leave school, etc, etc. And again, what impact do you think that has in terms of the development, both for the child as they became, become adults, and also of that community as a whole. I'm just going to show you some statistics. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm going to go back and speak to, like I said, I went with EAPPI, um, which is the Ecumenical Accompaniment Programme Palestine and Israel. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about them. So basically, they were set up and are run by the World Council of Churches. And this was in 2002 in response to a call from Palestinian church leaders um, to provide a protective presence within the region. Um, their bedrock, they would say, in terms of their values, is that of principled impartiality, and this is a direct quote from their website. It says, we are not pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli, and we do not take sides in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We are not, however, neutral in terms of international humanitarian and human rights law. And that's how they view it. They view it through the lens of international human rights law. That's how they look at the situation. Um, also, they would say that they stand with the poor, the marginalised and the oppressed. So what is it that they ask us to do when we go out there? Um, and actually, I'll probably just add to that, there's 22 um, nations that take part in this programme. So we go there to give protective presence. As I said, um, reports have shown that violence tends to reduce when you have an international presence. However, when we're not able to reduce that violence, we move into the next area, which is monitoring and recording human rights violations. And sometimes those are things we witness, and I did witness stuff, but I've chosen not to talk about that today. Um, but other times it may be that an incident has happened and we'll go and visit that family and record their witness testimony. But no matter what it is we do, we'd record that every single day, what it is we did when there was a particular incident, we'd write a special report and that gets shared with um, various partner agencies and would feed into things like UN and EU reports. 
The other thing we do is to stand in solidarity with Palestinian and Israeli peace group, and it's really important to understand that Palestinian peace groups that are resisting the occupation in a non-violent way, and also a number of Israeli peace groups that do incredible work in the area, and it often at great cost to themselves because quite often they're viewed in the, by the majority of Israeli society as traitors. Also, we do advocacy work, and this would be part of my advocacy work, speaking to you guys, but really it's just about raising awareness about the situation, at least encouraging people to become informed, and if it moves them to perhaps do something more than that. So I'm just going to show you some photos of us doing our work. That's me with red hair. Those of you who knew me before I went with a scheme of red hair, I got back to my natural colour now. Um, but this was the um, hill that I stood at the bottom of with my teammates waiting for children to come down. And that's the jacket. I didn't wear it tonight, but if any of you want to see it, I do have it in my wardrobe. <laughs> Some other ones. This is Rami, again, my teammate, walking with children to school. These are the children we're observing to make sure they can walk up the steps without issue. And this was us doing the monitoring work. And this here, you can't really see in that photo, but it's two little children, again, being made to wait at that turnstile for no discernible reason, um, trying to get through it in order to attend school. This was the team before us showing us, the, this is one of the days of showing us the ropes before we took over from them. And again, this is us saying hi. And it really made a difference. What we noticed is when children came down and saw us at the bottom of their stairs, they would smile. And that was a wonderful feeling because I feel like when you're there, you feel like you can affect such little change. But little things like that just make you think in the tiniest way that you were making a difference that day. So it's important what for us to happen understand the context. If you build a refuge for persecuted people in a place where another people already lived. In the next few minutes, you'll learn why this moral quandary is at the root of the struggle between Israelis and Palestinians, and what you can do to help achieve a just peace for everyone in the region. First, there are a couple of things it's helpful to understand. One, many Jews fled harsh persecution in anti-Semitic Europe, especially the Nazi Holocaust. Zionists encouraged massive emigration to historic Palestine, at that time a British colony, where Jews had an age-old connection and where small Jewish communities had long existed among larger groups of indigenous peoples. But when the UN offered the Jewish immigrants the majority of the land for a new state called Israel, for the indigenous Palestinians who lived there, it was a massive destruction of life. They rejected the UN's partition plan, and several Arab states invaded the new state of Israel. Israeli forces essentially erased over 400 Palestinian villages and towns. By the end of the fighting, Israel controlled 78% of historic Palestine. And when three quarters of a million Palestinians who fled or were expelled during fighting tried to return to their homes where the new state now stood, they were permanently barred by the Israeli government. While well, over 100,000 of their relatives and neighbors who hadn't left became second-class citizens of the new state along with the new Jewish majority. Today, Palestinian refugees and their descendants number in the millions. Most are in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and Jordan. Many are spread throughout the world, with millions still living in refugee camps, seeking to return to their homeland. To sum up, one group of refugees found a much-needed home, but in the process, a new group of refugees was created. Here's the second thing to understand. Israel was founded as a Jewish state, but now ask yourself, what exactly does that mean? People had lots of ideas about what a Jewish state should look like. Some called for equality for all citizens. But what was created in practice was institutional discrimination against non-Jews. In other words, Israel ended up being built on a blueprint of exclusion. The Israeli government wants maximum land and resources for Jews, but not the Palestinians living there. That's why, inside Israel, Jews get special privileges, including rights to land and housing, that are denied to the Palestinian citizens, who make up 20% of Israel's population. 
That's also part of why Israel has never defined its borders. In fact, they still hold on to land, the West Bank and Gaza, that they conquered in the war in 1967. Since then, Israel has built Jewish settlements throughout the occupied West Bank, building Jewish-only cities and supplying them with infrastructure like roads and army camps, schools, and even a college. Military occupations are meant to be temporary, but after 40 plus years, this one looks permanent and entirely unjust. In the West Bank, Israeli Jewish settlers and Palestinians live on the same land, but must live under two completely separate and unequal systems of Israeli law. The Jewish settlers dominate the natural resources, including water and agricultural land, and they're backed by the Israeli army. To maintain the occupation, Israel has demolished thousands of Palestinian homes and orchards, confiscated Palestinian land, bombed a captive civilian population in Gaza, and punished resistance with raids, arrests, and assassinations, all to gain maximum land while making life so difficult for Palestinians that they will either leave or be too afraid to resist. Palestinians have fought back. For decades, they tried to achieve national liberation through armed struggle. Some groups still do. But the majority now support the popular protest instead. The deeply harmful pattern of control, repression, and violence profoundly harms Palestinians living under occupation and Israelis living as occupiers. This must be broken to reach a peaceful and secure future for both peoples. Now that you understand the problem, what about the solution? What about peace talks? So far, over two decades of U.S.-backed peace talks have actually made things worse by helping Israel continue the occupation. It's been years of talking while Israel massively expanded the Jewish settlements and literally redrew the map. Peace talks are good if they're real, but not when they're theater to cover a land grab. So now what? The current world superpower, the United States, has been a terrible friend. Enabling Israel's destructive and self-destructive expansion onto Palestinian land by funding the Israeli military, the biggest recipient of U.S. foreign aid in the world. But there's another superpower that can make the difference. You. Okay. So that was actually on a video that's created by an amazing organization called Jewish Voice for Peace. And so it's really important for us just to get a little bit of context, because you might be asking, well, how have we ended up in the situation we're in? It's from a few years ago now, because actually the occupation has, con has been continuing of the West Bank for over a hundred, um, a hundred, sorry, <laughs> getting distracted <laughs> by the technical issues, um, by over um, 51 years now. Um, so I'm just going to go through some key dates. Thank you, Lee. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of these, just some of the most important that kind of reflected. So the Zionist movement um, was a movement that was set up in 1897 in Europe um, as a consequence of the persecution that Jews had faced for centuries in the region. And it basically was the idea that Jews needed their own um, nation um, because they felt that they would never be accepted wherever they lived. Um, in 1917, which is probably the most important thing, Lord Balfour um, released what's called the Balfour Declaration. It basically was just a letter. And in it, he said, His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So just some others, obviously um, the video referred to the UN partition plan and I'll just, obviously it wasn't accepted, it, um, it was rejected by the Palestinians and the reason for that is the UN partition plan was going to assign 55% of historical Palestine to the Jews, which made up about 12% of the population at that time, and 45% to the Palestinians. In 1948, we see after the British left, um, the British were occupying prior to this, Israel declares its independence, 
but this period of time is referred to by Palestinians as the Nakba because it saw 750,000 Palestinians being expelled or leaving um, because of fear for their lives into the surrounding areas and saw over 500, village, um, 500 Palestinian villages destroyed. 67 obviously was a war between Israel and Egypt and saw um, Palestine, um, Israel occupy the rest of the area. In 87 to 93 we have the first Intifada. Then we have what is called the um, Oslo Peace Accords and the idea of the Oslo Peace Accords was a period of time um, <coughs> to come to some kind of, of settlement. Um, and the area in the West Bank was split into areas called A, B and C. Um, a being completely under Palestine, well, uh, supposedly completely under Palestinian um, control. B, the administrative affairs being under Palestinian control, and then um, the security being under Israel, and Area C completely being under Israel. And the idea was for all of that land to transfer into Palestinian authority control within five years. Um, and then you have a uh, second intifada, and then a number of operations, especially on, on Gaza after Hamas won the elections, in fact there were issues before that. Um, and the most uh, recent date, which is significant, obviously is in 2017, when of course Donald Trump recognised um, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and decided to move the US embassy to the city. It's really important to understand that that is recognised as being illegal under international law. So it's important when we look at this to kind of understand what is, you know, obviously I've given you the situation as I witnessed it and what the law says, but what is, is the Israeli perspective on it? Because that's important to understand that too. And basically this is from um, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs briefing, and this is what the, it says. The West Bank is not the sovereign territory of any other state and therefore cannot be considered as occupied. Jewish people are returning to their ancient homelands and not being transferred by an occupying power. The building of homes, so the settlements, has no effect on the final permanent status of the West Bank. But when we consider the Israeli perspective, I want to go back and remind you about all the incredible Israeli peace groups that are working really hard in support of Palestinian rights. And I'm going to show you some photos of some friends. So here we have a friend of mine called Jose, who works for an Israeli organisation called Tayush, which also gives protective presence and does a, a, a number of amazing things throughout the area. And here he is having a nap. This is when we were doing, um, for those of you who have kind of spoken to me about it, um, about Khan al um, I'm not going to talk about that, but you can look it up. So we were doing, um, it's at risk of demolition, and we were doing night shifts there. So that was during one of my night shifts. It's um, an area close to Jerusalem. Um, this is also at Han al and this is an uh, Israeli and actually Palestinian organisation, these are all Israelis, called Combatants for Peace, and there's an interesting documentary um, on it called Disturbing the Peace, and basically these are Israelis and Palestinians that are working together, um, speaking, because they feel that in order to kind of move forward, they first of all need to speak just as ordinary humans, one-to-one. Um, -one. And this is a former Israeli soldier from Breaking the Silence, and Breaking the Silence is an organisation where when soldiers have left the Israeli army, they basically are whistleblowers, and they talk about what it is that they're required to do as occupying forces. Um, also, you'll find, you can find them online, Breaking the Silence, and you can hear a lot of their witness testimony, which is really important. Um, some of them will actually be whistleblowers whilst they're still in the army, which is also why their names are kept um, anonymous. And actually, on um, one of the times I was there, I walked down and gave protective presence to breaking the silence because they also find that they get attacked often by settlers also who perceive them as traitors. And I just want to go back again to thinking about the day at school that stood out for you. You know, hopefully you remember why it stood out for you. You know, randomly for me when I was thinking about this, because I think that's the thing, is when I was in Hebron and considering what the children were facing on a daily basis, it made me think about what days they will reflect back on. And because of that, it made me think back to my days. And one of the days that stood out for me was um, a day at Holya when I had my name shouted out across the, uh, the school hall by Mrs Webber, 
who called me across and gave me a good telling off for wearing a luminous socks that didn't conform with the uniform. Anyone who knows me might find that as a bit of a surprise that I wasn't conforming to, to the school uniform. But I think that what I want to say is that imagine these children, what they're facing, what are they going to be reflecting on when they're older? And I suppose my commitment, you know, anyone who knows me will know I've always been interested in, in human rights. Also part of that, recognising that any one of us at any point in time could have found us in this situation. But I suppose what motivated me to go and to do the things that I do is the hope that one day that these children, the day that they will remember, that will stand out for them and will be able to reflect back upon <coughs> is a day that will see freedom, justice and equality for Palestinians and all in that region. Now I've spoken to you about some stuff, actually I'll just go through a couple more photos because it would be nice to see some more children. So these are children from a, um, a kindergarten, there's Aliha who makes incredible food, if you ever go there she's definitely somebody worth looking up. Um, and we went to visit her and find out more about what she does in her school. And this is me with, um, I can't remember this little boy's name here on the right, but Mohammed, who I used to see often and helped him once to be able to get his bike through a checkpoint, a beautiful little boy that I used to see regularly. And this is me here with um, uh, Montessa and, and his father. And Montessa was a little boy that got run over whilst I was there by Israeli settlers. Fortunately, um, he was just in hospital for a few days, had problems with his leg, um, but it wasn't more serious than that. But you might be asking me after listening to this, it can seem very depressing and overwhelming, and you might be thinking, well, what can I do about it now I know this? Um, well, if you're part of a group or anything, you can host the talk. Um, <coughs> At the moment, I'm the only one from the Channel Islands it's been, so it would likely be me, but there are people you can bring over from the UK. Um, visit Israel and Occupy Palestine, and I can't encourage this enough, is often people think, oh, it's a little bit scary, you know, to go there. But as a European, we have a privilege, um, which most of you will probably understand, and you really will be safe. But I'd really, there's some amazing groups that you can go with and do a tour there, and I'd really encourage that, because it's an amazingly beautiful land, um, but it's important to see what's happening there because it's really difficult to articulate what that is. But also, um, along with that, to meet the Palestinian people, which I can say are the warmest, bravest, most beautiful, hospitable people that I've ever met. Stay in the forms. You know, if you want to find out any more about what's happening, please speak to me or to others involved in the group in a room. Obviously, inform others. If you're a little bit braver, you might start wanting to contact our local politicians and representatives. And it's really important to understand that I have been informed we do have settlement money in our island. Um, and that was by an Israeli that, that told me that, an Israeli group. Um, so it might be something you want to express concern about, especially as our ministers do try to seek deeper relations with Israel. Support Israeli peace groups, like I said, really want to put the focus on Israelis that are brave and taking that stance. Give tonight a um, uh, Jersey Palestine Solidarity campaign who are hosting me. I know that you know that in my other role I am involved in that, but they're hosting me today and actually um, this obviously, uh, any event we have doesn't come without cost. It's with a bucket, but the donations will be split between um, the Jersey Palestine Solidarity campaign and the APPI so they're able to spend, um, send more people into the region. And if you're interested, become an EA yourself. If you want to find out how you do that, I'd be more than happy to kind of give you some direction. So I want to finish on one final quote, because sometimes when I look at the world, I find it really difficult to believe, especially at the moment as we see the rise of the right and we see so many terrible things facing us. And sometimes it can seem overwhelming and we can think there's nothing we can possibly change. But actually there's been movements before us that managed to do many things, whether it's a civil rights movement, whether it's ending slavery, for us women being able to vote. But there's a quote that always encourages me, and it's a quote by Margaret Mead. And she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much.
thank you. And if anyone's got any questions, please fire away. Or if you're tired because it's gone a little bit longer than I hoped, then please feel free also to go. <laughs> Good evening, um, Natalie. Um, a very interesting um, presentation, and um, I liked the history element. Um, may I ask you, um, do you see a political tsunami situation in the future? And you do say um, on a couple of occasions this evening that there are issues that you can't really talk about. Um, well, just there were situations that I chose to not kind of speak about this evening, but I'm happy to speak to those on an individual basis, you know. Um, in terms of political tsunami, do you mean in terms of changing things or um, in what, in what, do you mean like whether things are going to change? Yeah. Um, it's difficult to say. I, I, what I would say, I mean, sometimes again, looking at the world and this rise of the right, it can be... We can seems things seem very bleak, and we might sort of wonder whether that is at all possible. But as I keep being reminded at work, the pendulum swings, and at the moment we're swinging to the right. What we're hoping is at some point it will start swinging in the other direction. But that can only happen when people take a stand and move. <coughs> what I will say in terms of the um, opinion of average people, that has hugely changed. Our media, for for many many years, has only really given one kind of viewpoint on the situation we're very rarely provided with a context um but what i will notice even myself from becoming involved in the subject but generally you can look at the numbers um even in in america actually is we're seeing more and more people becoming more sympathetic or empathetic towards the palestinian cause and i think that that means um that things can change you know there's a growing movement um pushing back um the World Council of Churches doesn't take a stance in terms of BDS, but that also is worth looking at because what you're seeing is more people, the boycott, divest and sanction movement, um, are seeing huge sort of gains. I know HSBC have just recently chosen to divest after a lot of pressure um, from Elbit, which is an Israeli arms company. So I think progress is being made. I mean, what the solution is, I've got no idea. I guess time will tell, but when we look at um, apartheid South Africa, that kind of came out the blue. It took many years for that movement to really gather momentum and, and bring about um, change. On your screen you spoke about assassinations and then you sort of gave a list of issues. I, yeah. was, I was building it around that. Oh, okay. Well, I'll do, I'll, yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Thanks, you. Absolutely. Any other right. questions? Um, yeah, I was wondering, with, with the Israeli government and the Palestinians that's due to a fear of their persecution that they've had in the past or is it something more sinister than that and do you sometimes relate to <coughs> the Israelis in terms of, of how they felt in the past of the Jews being persecuted or do you think it's just just uh, brutality and there's no sort of um, reason reason for it in that sense. Okay, um, I think I can't really talk on behalf of the Jewish people and I think what I would encourage people to remember is that, that not all Jews support what Israel is doing so there's not one single individual um, thought on, on the situation, not even in Israeli society. Um, you know, I think Jewish Voice of Peace did a really good job in their video of explaining perhaps what led to the situation in, in the region, you know, that they were suffering from persecution for many centuries in Europe, that's beyond question. Um, obviously the Holocaust, um, I think, um, really um, gave momentum, I suppose, to the Zionist movement itself, because obviously they tried to completely um, uh, eliminate them as, as a people, so I can understand that. In terms of what they're doing now, I would say it's a colonial project. So whatever the reasons might have been originally, what we're seeing actually is colonialism um, and all the issues that brings as opposed to anything else. Um, but I wouldn't like to answer the question beyond that. You know, I, I met a number of Israelis with a wide ranging opinions from those who think that the occupation needs to continue and the Palestinians need to leave into surrounding areas, all the way to through to people who really strongly 
oppose the occupation and are horrified at what's being done to the Palestinian people. Yeah, because it seems like a very unique situation in terms of you know other occupations. It's like this one. It's it's very you know, different, in, and it's hard to sometimes see what the motivations are of, of the Israelis. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean in terms of what the motivations are now, I think that's very clear. You know, it's about land. <laughs> Yeah, at the end yeah. of the day and controlling demography. Um, in terms of um, anything else, it's a bit, you know, yeah, it, it's a difficult, it's a protracted occupation, it is different because it's gone on. I mean, it's the longest occupation in, in modern history and it's more than occupation. I would say that there's other elements involved, like I said, colonialism, um, segregation and all these other things and Gaza, obviously, which is under um, an illegal blockade is something altogether different and quite often gets forgotten in when we look at the region and, and the area. Uh, how do you feel about um, change coming around uh, solely through education and uh, generational like su succession and the indoctrination of parents on the next um, the next generation of what could be either you know kind of like neutralists or you know, soldiers on either side. How how do you feel about how do you feel about that? How do I feel about how it's affecting people the indoctrination in terms of how they view stuff going forward? Yeah, well the, the extent of it something being perpetuated just by by the people that are in, in the struggle. Okay, um, so what I would say is obviously when you've got something that's going on for so long and in order to inflict that degree of oppression on another people, you first have to dehumanise, that's a fact, history shows us that, because actually I really believe that most of us are decent enough people, we don't want to harm people, if we look at our own colonialist history, in order for us to accept what was done to other countries, you first of all had to view other people as less civilised, less human than us, and that's how we start accepting things. So I think you see very similar in terms of that area. But like I said, everybody's different. You know, I met, you know, even when I was there in, in Hebron, I saw soldiers who came from a unit called the Nahal unit um, who had, um, who clearly were very uncomfortable about being in occupied territory. So all, all the indoctrination they might have received and, you know, the, so the military goes into nursery schools, kindergartens, all the way up to universities, and obviously they conscripted into the army. Um, so they do have that indoctrination. It's a very militarised society. I won't go into all the ins and outs of, of sort of things that I've heard, because we did have a talk on the subject by an Israeli amazing woman you can see on Twitter called Ruth Hiller. Um, but I think that actually a number of those soldiers, when they go into it, you know, no matter how much somebody's being dehumanised, they're then having to be face to face with them and see children and see people and see what it is and that's why a number of them end up joining things like breaking the silence or um, also uh, Israel has some of the highest um, suicide rates for, for army, for, um, you know, for forces um, and that's really important but in terms of other people, yeah I would say if you want to understand what Israeli, perhaps the general consensus is, I'd have a look at the Israeli elections now and how people are running and on what platform they are running on. Because if you look at people like Benny Gantz, um, his advertising campaign is a video that shows um, the number of Palestinians that were killed in Gaza and, how, and, and proudly states how he bombed Gaza, parts of Gaza back to the Stone Ages. Um, another candidate who's running um, has an interview with a guy um, proudly who he associates himself self with called Elor Azaria. And Elor Azaria was based in Hebron, and it's seen there was an incapacitated Palestinian who was suspected of having stabbed or attempted to stab a soldier, um, an occupying soldier, and he went as he was lying on the floor and shot him in the head. Um, so I would say if you want to understand what the consensus is, have a look at how people are running their campaigns. Thanks. Is that good? Thank okay, well, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just. Oh, this is a very sensitive issue. Okay. Um, it's also on the 28th of January, um, Monday. Um, this will probably frighten people. Um, what it is, um, I didn't listen to the whole thing, 
Um, okay. It was on the Jeremy Vine show, um, lunchtime at 12 o'clock, and um, they have said that um, one out of 27 people do not believe that the Holocaust mm -hmm. took place. Yeah. And that's horrendous. Um, yeah, what I would say is I don't really want to bring yes. that conversation no, up here no, because I, I think I it's a separate that, issue. It's really important. That yeah, that's horrendous. And I think, no, thank you, Derek. And I think thank what I would you. say is that that shows a real yes. concern. And this is what I'm saying about the rise of the right. And that's really concerning. And we should all be working against that, you know. Um, but I'm not going to bring the Holocaust question oh, no, up because no. I think it's I'll a completely it, unrelated um, topic. Everybody good? <laughs> All right, thank yeah. you so much, guys. <laughs>